So uh, today your media diary uh, was due at the start of class. And uh, if that's a shock, get it in as soon as you can so that you avoid uh, the terrible penalties for late work. Um, and also as a uh, message to all folks who are primarily streaming the class, um, and to anyone who's thinking of doing that as well. You know, Census Day is coming up soon. It's very difficult to track exactly who's participating or not. So it's essential to get um, assignments and stuff in on time so that I know that you're actually with us in the class. Uh, it's great also if you join us streaming that you use chat. So that's cool. So I can at least tell that people are still with the class because we don't want to get to a situation where we get deep into the semester and it turns out somebody had something come up and they couldn't participate and they wanted to drop and they couldn't do that, you know. And uh, so um, I can help make sure that registration stays as <coughs> clean as possible by seeing you guys turning in work and doing work. So into that message. Um, Cool. So how did the uh, writing assignment go, your media diary? Would anyone uh, like to share any experiences or <coughs> discoveries that came about from, remember, the idea was to track three days of your media use and to try to give up some medium that you use pretty essentially and see how that went. Corey? Uh, I noticed that I obsessively check my Facebook throughout the day. For you. I mean, without even... Like, I'll look at it, okay, and I'll be waiting at the bus stop. I just looked at it three seconds ago. Why am I looking at it again? Okay, so when you took it away, you were... I, yeah, I, I took that away, and then I, found, I kind of... I noticed I spent more time on other things. Like, I was watching TV a lot. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, okay. Yeah, TV people would... hard, because I'll be on the bus, and then I'll see everyone just... <laughs> yeah. That's All right. Happened to me. <laughs> Is that right? Who was Richard? You had that too, yeah. I was introduced to a whole new world. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly aware of your immediate surroundings again. I, I noticed that a lot of people shout a lot at the bus, a lot <laughs> to each other for some no reason, and that was a new thing for me too. So your phone helps tune that out in a way. I mean, yeah, I'm always yeah. on Spotify or podcast and in my own world. Got you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, being able to concentrate on something else on a mobile device does that. And, you know, there's a whole, uh, we talked about uses and gratifications of media, um, which is a, a, a research methodology and a whole way of thinking about media, the idea that, you know, people use it for a certain reason. And, of course, one reason that's well documented is to, you know, in, keep yourself, distract yourself, keep yourself from being bored and also to um, regulate mood as well. So I don't know if anyone you know, listens to music to keep things calm. You're nodding, yeah? Was that part of your experience of the? Uh, yeah, I basically, when I'm not in school or at work, I'm always listening to music. But um, so I, I left the country for the weekend, so it was inevitable that I had to stop using my phone for those three days because I had no phone reception. It was good though because I, I got to spend more time with my family that I know that I would have otherwise used you know, my phone. But I, I caught myself like grabbing my phone and looking at it even though I knew I was not gonna get You're not connected. anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was good for me. But I did notice that I kept like checking my phone. Like it was just like, it's habitual. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The way I should be checking chat, and I don't necessarily do it. <laughs> JP? JP? Like, I tried to give up, like, using my phone on the weekend, but I had, like, my tablet or something. And ever since then, I hadn't really been listening to my phone that much. Oh, which is something you used to do? Yeah, a lot. So what happened? You kind of you just broke the habit right there on the weekend, or? Well, not on the weekend, but like in general. In general. Oh, okay. So the tablet's less mobile than the phone. So you you were kind of suggesting that you could replace the phone with a tablet, but did that work all the way, or was lack of mobility something that was uncomfortable? Without I was at home. You're at home. Okay. So it didn't change too much. 
Did anybody give up anything that wasn't like a, an Android or an Apple device? Yeah, Nika? I gave up my phone and my laptop. And your laptop. Yes. Wow. I used them about equally and I couldn't decide. And I just, I really spent the whole day just reading. Okay, a book or a newspaper? Yeah, I know you get a newspaper, right? I was well, the newspaper in the morning, of course, but just the phone for about seven hours straight. That was good. Wow. It was okay. also the day it was 106. Yeah, the weekend was not Everybody. wasn't a day for going out much. Yeah, Jonathan? Yeah, I found uh, for the most part the day that I decided I also removed my phone and laptop. But that day I was very very busy. I had work to do. I also was uh, doing things with my wife all day. So it's just like, hey, this is easy, no big deal. But after yesterday, where the internet went down at the at the campus here, I felt like way worse because it was out of my control. Like, I didn't choose to do it. Now I, I had a lot of projects I wanted to get done at the oh, library, yeah. Yeah. and I couldn't do them anymore. I couldn't even log in. So I was like, man, just the lack of online connectivity really just, like, hampered my day. And I had 70 minutes in between each class. So I was just like, great, now I'm just here waiting all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was uh, just an interesting perspective that it was when you took choice out of the equation. And I was like, oh, man, this, this is actually, I don't like this as much. Inch, olive one sec, or, or yes, maybe sir, you, yeah. maybe you were thinking. Oh, I was just saying olive one sec, but maybe you were. Th were you were you gonna talk, say something about Jonathan's experience, or? I think everyone's gone through that, where like the internet or the electricity is shut off, and you're just kind of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Best way to put it, you don't really know what else to do, except oh my god, I wonder what they're doing or what they're saying. Yeah. Do you ever think like how technology has crept into our expectations about what we can do and stuff? It's like, you know, 20 years ago, connectivity wasn't there. And then, but now it's an expectation. And when, when it's missing, it's a frustration, you know, and electric light probably too. You know, when it first comes in, everyone's like, wow, we can see anytime we want. Now there's a power failure. It's like, damn, you know, what's wrong? So it, it really enters into our, our expectations. I was just going to say, because um, I gave up my phone pretty much predominantly, uh, except for uh, phone calls, texts, and emails. Um, I, when I went to the gym, that was probably the hardest part of it because I couldn't listen to Pandora or YouTube music. So I'm sitting there just listening to people claim the weights, and I'm just like, all right, I, I got to go. And it totally shrunk the time I was there by like half. Mm, okay. So there are moments when you miss it more. Like, it, did most people miss stuff that is usually entertaining? Or, well, Jonathan, you were talking about getting work done. But also, um, how about information? Is, or do we have news junkies who are frustrated by having that, you know, connection cut? Richard? I forgot that I didn't want to watch. So I couldn't tell, the, tell my time throughout the day. So I'd keep on asking strangers about it. <laughs> OK. And then I, chose Saturday to give up my phone, which I didn't know it would be that hot. And I had to, I wanted to know how hot it was, so I had to take my laptop out wherever I got a chance to check the weather. The temperature. It was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Olive? Uh, I actually uh, stopped using my computer for a full day. Mm. And I use Amazon Fresh for grocery shopping mm. and like basic necessities, <laughs> apples or whatever. <coughs> and it was very difficult for me to have to get out of my apartment and walk to the grocery store. Mm. I'm so used to getting it before 7 a.m. Oh, wow, okay. Right my door. Okay, so that's a pretty practical thing that didn't, Nowadays, didn't happen. Nowadays, yeah. five years ago, yeah. people would think I would be crazy if I said something like that. Ordering groceries on your laptop, what? Yeah, yeah, all right. Sandra? Um, I gave up my phone the day that we had the, like the peak of the heat wave. And it was really annoying because I kept trying to check what the temperature had risen to. Right. And um, I was actually like, I went home and was just hanging out with my mom that day. I got out of the city and like, we were like doing errands. And I found like, I didn't notice how many times a day I just look up useless information on my phone. Like, like we were, we were at a tire store and there was a magazine with Kate Hudson on it, and my mom and I were arguing about who Kate Hudson's dad was. And I was like, no, I'm That's right. Like, I'm, it's, she's like, Kurt Russell's his dad. And I was like, it's absolutely not her name would be Kurt, Kate Russell. 
And right. she's like, no, Zonder, no one goes by their dad's last name. <coughs> this huge argument, and I was just like, no, I have to find it. I have to prove that I'm right. And Is your mother right? But it was just like, was just like <laughs> a silly anecdote. But it was like little stuff like that all day. It was like, oh, I want to look that up. I want to look up the temperature. I want to look it. And we're just constantly like fact-checking. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, did, did, does anyone else, or, like there's a lot of stuff you can find out now that doesn't really make a difference that you could know it or not, right? I mean, that, that type of stuff. Yeah, but how long would you go before without Google Truth when you would think of something and be like, damn, all day. But now, I wish like, I knew that. You know, right, I mean, yeah. 20 years ago, you'd, you'd just be screwed. Yeah, well, I got, I was, <laughs> I was 20 years it. ago, I wasn't like desperate to, I mean. Oh, you probably were, any little thing, who that actor was, uh, even now, you just go into it. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of the same types of conversation that yeah. Saunders talking now about. Now it's just quick. Except now you can solve the issue, I yeah. guess. That's true, you know, yeah, that's true. Um, Micah, and then I, you wanna... I, I did see uh, like this kind of documentary on libraries, and it mentioned like, before there was Google, people would call up the library and ask questions, and like it showed some libraries had huge like, like just Home notebooks of, yeah. of like questions people had asked and that they still needed to answer, and they were all the stuff that you would just Google. Just Interesting. Like, oh, what's that? Interesting. Well, remember Jeeves? Mm-hmm. That was the yeah, true. So that was the idea that like people would just be thing. checking stuff. <coughs> they, they, that was the marketing ploy. Was that's what people will need to do with this thing? List information. Sort of like to add on to what you said, but I remember when I was younger, you'd go to the library and they would have like the physical cards for who checked out the book and when and they would have the stamps and everything on the catalog. Way before the online catalog was like even a thing. And then as time went on, it was kind of weird to see how they don't even do that anymore. It's all just like you look it up and it tells you who checked it out or like if it's missing, whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's Gino, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just saw some archival footage of that whole thing. I was like making a video to raise money for like, you know, libraries to get laptops and stuff. And I put some of that in. But, but that's interesting too, because I still think it's worth calling libraries and talking to, uh, to you know, um, uh, what are they called? Reserves, the reserves librarians. The people, because the thing is you can Google like crazy and you won't get into the proprietary databases that have information which could you know like statistical information let's say you're trying to find out how many people get sick with some sort of disease as we talk about this in the writing class too but and it's like well you could try to google that and then you have to sift through what might be varying levels of good information uh, but there are also databases which are you know now usually for profit so someone has to subscribe to it your local library subscribes to hundreds of these databases but you probably don't even know that they exist and by searching Google you won't find out you know even the name of that database so just a, just a plug for reference librarians even over here or at uh, San Francisco Public or wherever you live it's maybe just worth a call to call them and say, well, how would I find out, you know, the infant mortality rate in California? And they usually can tell you like super fast, not because they have binders, but because, you know, because they, they get to know really well information. Anyway, boy, there's a strange plug for, <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, the other thing I was just thinking about is, is um, a, a general idea about innovation, which is simply like, you know, a lot, of, a lot of innovation comes with the notion that people need this. You know, uh, uh, let's say market, market needs drive innovation. That's one way to look at it. But the other thing you look at it is, you know, put the device in someone's hand and they start just fooling with it and work it into their lives. And then they're looking stuff up and they're trying to find out and solving, you know, these mundane questions or stuff. I don't think anyone ever would have thought I need to spend $700 in order to, you know, have a device that would resolve, you know, who Kate Hudson's dad is. But um, now that you've got it, it becomes a whole part of what you do, you know. And uh, it's interesting that the, the, the essay that I'm thinking of, the research I'm thinking of, was actually looking at um, fertility, fertility, art, artificial fertility um, procedures or something, which is a pretty heavy question in a lot of people's lives if they can't, they want to have a child, they can't have a child. And when this technology comes out, 
which says, well, maybe you can have a child if you use this technology. It changes your entire, like, everything about your decision-making process about something, which is a really heavy question in life. So it was just that, that whole idea about, you know, what drives the innovation? Is it the need, or does the need suddenly appear when the innovation becomes possible? A lot of people would have just said, sorry, can't have kids. Maybe we'll adopt, maybe we'll just be great, you know, godparents or something. Um, then all of a sudden, no, maybe we can harvest your eggs. It may take six years of drug treatments and hassle and horrors, it may never work, but you can have that now, and like all of a sudden, that's a need. Right? And then the insurers have to supply it stuff. So, so it's the, the same kind of chicken and egg issue. It's like, is there a need which makes people say, I need a 4K TV, man. It's not sharp enough, you know? Really? Does that, really? You know? Or is it, hey, we got to push some new TV sets. Uh, 4K sounds good. Let's see if they'll buy it, you know? And it's there, and now you need it, you know? And so it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that you could think about in an essay also about... Uh, you know, what drives innovation and stuff. Um, I look forward to reading all of those. Olive, more to add? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I watched uh, America's Got Talent on Tuesday, and I used my computer to vote. Since I couldn't use my computer, I felt like I wasn't part of that. <laughs> got you. I wanted to can't, you can't that. phone in anymore or something? <laughs> I just really wanted to, I wanted to kind of get the whole sense of not being able to be a part of it. Okay. Okay, it, it was just a little... It, kind of got me a little flustered. Did that diminish the show? Like, do you think you'd, I, you'd be less interested in that type of show if you couldn't participate that way? Yeah. And plus, the next day, the person who I wanted to vote for wasn't part of it anymore. He got oh, eliminated. Dang. Your vote might have tipped might the have balance. It, right. Blue know. state, red state. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, the producers take great pains in order to build interactivity even into old media. <laughs> we were talking about that, actually, probably with a similar example, you know. So, um, yeah, it's interesting to feel that you, it was, you know, the show's a little less interesting if you can't participate as much. And they'd be happy to hear it because they put all that effort into it. Cool. Well, I will read these, and uh, if you don't mind... Uh, uh, I may, you know, cherry pick some other interesting insights and sort of like, you know, bring them up and ask about it. But thanks all for doing that. I hope it was, you know, uh, worth the hassle. Um, and uh, there'll be more opportunities to reflect on your media use and what you're doing. I know last class we kind of rammed through a lot of uh, historical information and we'll probably have to do that next Tuesday um, because there's just so many events and facts and that led to where we are uh, today. I want to go review for the quiz. Uh, well, we're cahooting today again to get some of those questions out in your consciousness. And then I have to see if the cahoots can be used for review or whether we have to do like a, you know, whether I have to kind of grab them all and, and spend a class period reviewing. So, so we'll, we'll uh, I'll check that out. It's on my to-do list. To learn more about cahoot. So far, I'm just trying to get the right answers associated with the questions. <laughs> so, I know, absolutely, right. Uh, watch out. Cool. Well, I, le I left the cliffhanger hanging in last week's class. Uh, or la yeah, sorry, the last, uh, last class. Anyway, regarding uh, three important people in the development of radio. So we were talking about Lee DeForest. Anyone remember what DeForest invented? You could look it up pretty easily, but Nika? Yeah. The vacuum tube? Uh, actually, the vacuum tube existed, but he adapted it and made the Audion tube, right? Remember? So he, it was a vacuum tube that he inserted a couple of extra components, and it turned into a radio receiver, right? But yeah, <laughs> good call. So the Audion, yeah. And then two other key figures we talked about, Edwin Howard Armstrong, who was the inventor of FM radio, almost single-handedly. And uh, um, uh, David Sarnoff, who was the, uh, started with the American Marconi Company that became RCA, and RCA needed to create a network, NBC, and Sarnoff became the president of NBC and lasted, uh, I don't want to exaggerate, but decades, you know, maybe 40 years, maybe 50 years as the head of NBC. Uh, and. Um, and yeah, so the cliffhanger uh, was simply that you know that DeForest and Armstrong were caught in an early, early legal battle about the rights to the Audion. 
because Armstrong's regenerative use of the audion um, made it a much more useful invention. You know, it, it amplified the radio signal a ton. Uh, however, it was still based on the audion, and so um, there was a back and forth about who should get credit for the regenerative circuit. Um, DeForest eventually takes that. Uh, Armstrong is a very, very uh, uh, competitive character. Brilliant, obviously, but driven and wants credit. Uh, so very upset that DeForest actually wins that patent battle. Even if Armstrong has made himself rich with another uh, invention, the heterodyne circuit, which, as we said, makes tuning the radio a lot easier. Uh, so he had millions of dollars and stock in RCA based on that. But he ran into troubles with Sarnoff, who was an early, uh, an early um, you know, promoter of Armstrong. Uh, Sarnoff, remember the head of NBC, uh, NBC in the 1930s is already looking ahead for television. Um, Armstrong, the radio engineer, says, I can uh, totally redo radio so that there's no longer any interference from electrical storms. We can get you better quality. It's this thing I have called FM radio. Instead of, amplitude, instead, of, instead of modulating the amplitude of the signal in radio, Armstrong figures out you can mo modulate the frequency, which makes it impervious to things like lightning storms, which would you know, make your radio literally un unintelligible because <laughs> there'd be so much static and stuff. But the pr and, and, and Armstrong has done this all himself. He's taken his millions from RCA. He's invested them in an experimental station with an antenna and stuff. In fact, he's made more than one so that he can, because he figures this is the next thing. I'm going to be super rich because I'm going to already have receivers, transmitters, stations in place. Even, even the experimental stations that started up in the early teens became you know, the most successful early AM stations, you know. So Armstrong says, it's going to happen again. I'm going to do it in FM. And Sarnoff, he thinks, is his, you know, collaborator, and RCA builds radio sets, right? Sarnoff is not interested. He shuts down Armstrong. He says, we've got television. We're, we're four years away from TV or wherever. We don't want to try to get everybody in America to buy an FM radio, you know, which doesn't work on AM. Uh, so forget it. So Armstrong was absolutely incensed, you know, in part because he'd invested so much because he felt that Sarnoff stabbed him in the back. And also he, as the engineer that he was, he knew this was way better and nobody would actually, you know, they wouldn't bankroll him. So um, he sunk money into that and then Sarnoff um, did a few other things. Apparently he lobbied Congress to change the FM frequency allocation. So when you're going to start up a new radio system, you have to determine some frequencies that the radios will work on, right? AM is pretty low. You may have noticed in your car like 880 kilohertz or something, right? When you get up to FM, it's like 88.5 <coughs> megahertz. So it's, a, it's an order of magnitude. It's another set of frequencies. Well, Armstrong had done his experimental stations with an open set of frequencies in mind. But when it came time to, you know, for the FCC to create, you know, the official rules, Sarnoff lobbied them so that they wouldn't be the same frequencies that uh, Armstrong was on. So there's a clear stab in the back. You know, it was basically all of his, all of his stuff was going to be commercially useless. So uh, Armstrong sued on a number of other patent issues, more minor stuff, I don't exactly remember. But he was, for years, still fighting more legal battles with DeForest uh, and with Sarnoff and RCA. Uh, he went from being a millionaire with you know, a paid-for Park Avenue you know, penthouse and stuff, where, in fact, he used to climb and climb these radio towers and stuff. Anyhow, quite a character. And he was married to Sarnoff's old executive secretary as well. So it was family, you know. Anyhow, he became increasingly depressed and indebted from all these legal battles. And eventually he committed suicide. 
he jumped out of the window of his Park Avenue penthouse and like fell down, uh, killed himself because he just um, was despondent over, I mean, he, the, the triggering incident was a falling out with his wife too, who was probably fed up with it all. So uh, that was uh, the end of the, the literal cliffhanger, whatever it says, of Armstrong's, you know, Armstrong's uh, uh, the brilliant, brilliant, without a doubt, the most brilliant inventor in radio. Um, and uh, so Sarnoff put out a press release. We did not kill Howard Armstrong. And eventually he gave a million dollars to Armstrong's widow and they canceled all of the battles in court and stuff. And that was the end of it. So there you go. Um, what was his total worth? Uh, suicide in the millions back then but I don't know and you know but he was indebted from all of the legal fees and stuff and they told him they told him that he would win but uh, it was gonna take like eight years or something it just took more and more and more time I mean, it's one guy fighting RCA you know so that's the thing corporations corporations can spin these things out for a long time you know anyway quite a story you know and quite a brilliant character usually I mean if you look at it yeah are there any conspiracies about if uh, somebody working for Sarnoff maybe helped him out the window? <laughs> he was alone at the time, pretty sure he wrote a suicide letter to his wife and stuff. But apparently he used to wear leather gloves. He pulled on the leather gloves and took a cane and jumped out that way. So, cane? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It was, he was like a, you know, <laughs> a stylish way to go. <laughs> what, what's your name, by the way? I, I never call on you. Uh, John. John, okay. Cool, thanks. Thanks for the question. Conspiracies, yeah, clearly Sarnoff felt that people were singling him out. Especially if it sounds like he was going to win. Yeah, it just was gonna take more time. And you can look again, um, I, <laughs> I can't remember my New York Times password and we don't have the time to spend on it anyway. But dig into the Times and look for, you know, search an article, Sarnoff, Armstrong. You'll find in there like a, a lengthy thousand word article written by Armstrong uh, after DeForest won the, his patent battle. And it was all like sort of like people never get credit for what credit is due. And so it was like a very, and that was 20 years before he committed suicide. He was already just totally down for not being credited with what he felt was his brilliance. Although he'd made <coughs> millions of dollars and he was credited with other great inventions. Well, you know, some people just can't get enough, I guess. There you go. There's some insight in electronic media. Other insight in electronic media, just quick, rapid fire. You know, looking at AM, <coughs> it's pretty clear that not just one person was responsible for creating AM radio. You know, it was a series of innovations from, you know, Hertz demonstrating that, you know, this, this spark gap could actually happen to Marconi <coughs> doing his kind of Morse code but tuned radio you know, to DeForest, who comes up with the Audion, which makes it much clearer, better tuned. Armstrong makes it louder. Armstrong does a bunch of stuff with the heterodyne circuit, making it easier to tune, and so on and so forth. So you've got, you know, at least a half dozen people who contributed. We forgot Fessenden, right, who was the first one to put uh, audio over it, and like speech and 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 a violin playing, in fact, is what he did. So all those people could be viewed as the innovators. So, you know, it's, it's uh, there's, uh, innovations are often a cumulative process, which is why there's so often messy patent wars involved as well, because everyone wants, you know, uh, credit for, you know, the bevel-less screen on your smartphone or something, which is a billion dollar issue between Apple and Samsung or something like that. So it's, Similar things going on. Um, another thing that we could look at is, you know, in, in early content, we didn't talk too much about content, and I don't know if we got too many slides on it, but um, a lot of early radio, obviously, it had to be live, first of all, or records, like recorded gramophone records. Um, so who would they use? They'd use the entertainers who exist, so popular singers, performers, uh, they used records that were produced. So another good thing to, you know, a, a pretty fair principle of electronic media would be that um, uh, the content of a new medium is usually old media to start with, you know. 
can you think about that in terms of the internet and yeah, Jonathan? We, we, we got uh, these uh, video street uh, video providers like Netflix or whatever, and they're in order to get you hooked on it, they put some new stuff on there, but it'll usually a swath of old stuff that makes you go, oh crap, I want to watch that. I remember watching that when I was a kid or whatever the case. Right, right. Yeah, so, yeah. so they're using the libraries for that used to be, you know, you used to get those in syndication, like 11 o'clock at night, you'd get some old sitcoms or something. Now you can have all of it that you want on Hulu, you know, just endlessly. So yeah, that's the old content, and yet they are producing new content. <laughs> Well, in part, and the other thing is they just don't have a lot to put on there. So, you know, you got a new distribution medium, and so you're going to use what you've got, but then you're going to add and start to develop, you know. If you look at YouTube, you know, the whole um, Viacom sued Google for copyright infringement because the early days of YouTube, people were copying little, you know, 15, 30 second pieces out of CBS shows and uploading them because they thought it was so hysterical, you know. But, and, and Google just let it happen, and then Viacom, who owns that, came back and sued for a whole pile of money. Uh, yeah, I remember watching full-length TV shows on YouTube. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. <laughs> well, now, and now they've managed to monetize it, so the distinction is a little less clear. People say, oh, yeah, you know, I can hear any song I want, right? But it's Vivo, probably, so, and they're, you know, they're, they're oh, using it. Enough. Yeah, yeah, so, so it took them a while, and thank goodness it, you know, they actually have paid attention to that rather than simply say no we're going to stick with our old distribution and then you know uh, criminalize anything else you know oh no people want it this way so let's find a way to make some money off of it and make it you know legal so i think at least to stream stuff so that's a good thing to think about as you look at new media you know even uh, I mean, VR is on the horizon, and uh, just it's a really interesting time to sort of look at okay, what kinds of projects are going to be using more immersive video technology. You know, you guys, by the time you're my age, it'll all be like old hat. You will have it will have developed around you in such a natural way, just like the mobile phone is now for everybody. It's like we just expect that, you know. So let's finish up with just a few things about history. Uh, and then, and there's some stuff about um, our our current uh, our current moment too. Um, yeah, you know, uh, we mentioned that in the First World War, the government took over all the radio patents and basically were then able to produce radios that were, you know, just the best that uh, they possibly could at that time. So it it calmed a lot of the patent wars. In the Second World War, that wasn't so much the issue for radio, but one thing that was important was that um, a lot of rationing was going on. Uh, so um, two things. First of all, television was ready, but they couldn't launch TV because all of the electronics were going to be dedicated to radar systems and stuff like that. So the government quashed the rollout of television. It's like, it's not going to happen until the war is over. Uh, and so although TV was ready to go, they had prototypes at the World's Fair in 38, uh, they didn't uh, commercialize it for that reason. Another thing is they were rationing paper, so newspapers couldn't print as much as they wanted to, which meant that advertisers were hungry for, uh, you know, more more access to markets, and so they went through radio because the radio is just it's there broadcasting. You don't have to print on paper, use any resource. So the Second World War was great for radio advertising because t uh, newspapers couldn't keep up. And whereas radio might have been, you know, um, uh, as what happened after the Second World War, when television comes on the scene, radio is no longer the dominant medium. Within four or five years, everyone's on to TV. So the war managed to extend the profitability and centrality of radio in the culture for at least the war period, you know, and a bit afterwards. So um, that's, that's another thing to, to keep an eye on is, you know, the competing, the, the competition amongst media for audience, which we're seeing today as well. And this would be a great term paper uh, ish, uh, thing to look at as well. It's like basically how do the media um, adapt themselves to remain competitive and, and continue to profit from the audience that they still have, you know. The Blue Book is where the FCC takes a stab at um, trying to regulate content, basically. Uh, so, and there's a long history to that, that we actually have a, uh, a chapter on law and ethics and legal matters, so we'll leave that for them. But, um, you know, the FCC is typically um, uh, being more about licensing 
and creating a good infrastructure for the broadcast uh, um, industry to work on, you know, so you can have a license to broadcast in a frequency in an area, you won't compete with somebody else. But uh, they, they did become um, uh, interested in content as far as politics goes. There was the fairness principle where you had to give equal, equal time to each political party as we said. And then uh, um, uh, later on there was also, you know, I issues around indecency uh, and offensive content, content, which is a little slightly lower barrier bar, bar that let's see there's offensive indecent obscene so obscene can get you to go to jail uh, indecent can get you a fine sometimes up to millions of dollars if you're Har Howard Stern <laughs> even move you you know he moved off of terrestrial radio onto satellite radio because his terrestrial stations kept getting fined right FCC doesn't cover satellite radio uh, so, so that's why Stern wound up there. But, so anyway, and then there's just plain old offensive stuff, which uh, as long as you do it, uh, what they call the safe harbor hours between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. You heard about it, Jonathan? Yeah. So there's, the FCC set aside says, we're not going to completely, we, we really don't want to mess with anybody's free speech rights. But broadcasting, it's a public airwaves. Um, we you, just the way we wouldn't let someone come set upside out your house and start screaming obscenities at the top of their lungs. We're not going to allow a broadcaster to come and do something equivalent. So we're going to keep that out, off the air. Eh, but the compromise was okay. The kids are in bed by ten, so now we can put blue movies and stuff on. So, so those are those are the the rules into the seven into the seventies. You know, and then we can we can look at that a little more a little later on. So when, when TV comes in uh, after the Second World War, uh, it's, you know, by 1948, there are three stations here in San Francisco, ABC, CBS, and NBC, uh, KGB, KGO, KCBS. So, you know, our stations, our, our major network stations go right back to the beginning. And we'll talk more about that, but, uh, you know, uh, and as we said, uh, the content of a new medium is very often the old medium, uh, TV came in and took tons of stuff from radio. All the variety, all the stars. They took show concepts like the Lone Ranger and Dragnet stuff. These were radio shows. These were huge radio shows. The other ones, can you remember? Cereals, they were cereals. Cereals, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, was the bread and butter, not cereal. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Just trying to keep you awake with my... So anyway, that was the bread and butter of the radio industry, right? Was these serials and variety shows and stuff all went over to TV. And uh, even like C CBS, which remember was the second network created a year after NBC. Uh, CBS was, uh, they developed a way of, of uh, creating corporations for these celebrities like Bing Crosby. Bing, come with us. You don't need to be an employee. We will be, you'll be a subcontractor and then you won't pay any tax, you know, so they all would come over and they all were built into TV stars. So what did radio have left? Radio had music, you know, and so you start to get what we are just seeing the dying days of music uh, radio, you know, that came up at the, in, in the early 50s as radio's like, well, no one's listening anymore. What can we put, let's put on some records, you know, and uh, then the record industry and radio kind of moved together and rock and roll happens you know in the mid 50s kids start spending a lot of money on records and listening to the radio and, and so it, radio reinvents itself really in a, in a serious way um, which this could be a, another topic for <coughs> a research paper right I promised that we would be um, just exploring together some of these topics right so um, this one here, you might start talking there and then build on it. So radio remains relatively popular and competitive despite competition from various other media. Discuss the factors that have allowed radio to survive in a telecommunications landscape driven by visual media, TV at least to start with, and proliferation of mobile devices. So now that's today. Consider radio's response to TV, which we just talked about, as well as radio's response to internet and mobile media. So what are you seeing happening now? You know, you know historically that uh, radio began playing music because TV cannibalized the stars, the shows, the, you know, the dramas, the comedies. 
So they play music. But now what's happening with, uh, with the internet and mobile? What's, ha well, how, what's happening with radio? Taking that from the TV. Go on, that. Richard. Well, TV took from radio, I think. Like, so TV took something from the radio. Right. The internet and the mobile device are taking that from the TV. I got it. Okay, but what's specifically what's radio doing? Okay, and I got you there. So, so internet is cannibalizing off of TV. Okay, Nika, what are you thinking about? Spotify radio? and Pandora are taking over from radio. Got you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and you had your hand up in the back. Yeah. Yeah, I think some stations are allowing like streaming of their radio <coughs> station. You can actually stream online. Yeah, good point. You don't even need radio, but I mean, they're still the radio station. Yeah. Remind me of your name? Tony. Tony. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, that's two major developments. Uh, the use of the internet and streaming as a kind of complementary thing to regular broadcasting, which is, you might have thought, you know, you might be willing, so I'll get to you guys, you might have been thinking, uh, sounds really good if I said radio's dead, streaming's happy, but actually what's happening is it's not quite dead, and while it's not quite dead, uh, there's, they're working together, basically. It's, a, it's an audience extender, and then Nika is talking about what's actually killing radio, which is that you know, you no longer need radio to hear music because you can hear it so many different ways and more personalized and stuff. And, and Jonathan, what did you want to say? I uh, know you, you hit it pretty much uh, pretty well, but yeah, how internet helps uh, uh, complement uh, listening to radio. So like if you were to go to NPR.com, you can see, oh, what's coming up next? Now I can get a full view of well, what I can be tracking later or even if they're doing a, uh, you're listening to the classical radio station online, It'll tell you what's played in the past two hours or so. so gotcha. Yeah. Oh, cool. This is what they're up to. So it, it really complements the experience too. Yeah. And if you miss a broadcast, you can pick it up as a podcast, yeah. right? Do you know? And that's is that part of why podcasts got big? Is because on the radio you have either talk or music most of the time. Talk shows. And if people didn't want to listen to music, they'd want the talk for the most part. What, what, what do you guys think, Michael? <laughs> I think the re like part of the reason why podcasts like what became what essentially is today is because it's it's a lot more it's a lot less restrained by like time yeah and like yeah they got they got like they always have to have sponsors and like they always got to show but then they have control over when and when they can actually implement that but I think that's just the, the biggest the biggest advantage podcast has over talk radio is you know you have time and then they can also have the, the, the content they have like complete control of the content they can say curse words they can yeah yeah yeah. Do the things that most radio just uh, just they can't offer. Right, and you can make a sixty-three minute so show if you want. I mean, same thing for you know Netflix as as video. Yeah, uh, John. Yeah, and also the how specific the content is. So like if it's on a NBC, you're not going to get it's just, it's going to cover a variety of news options. But right, you right. Podcast, you can get something on just Tesla or something on. A specific medium you want to listen talk absolutely about. so you can the much more granular uh content to reach out to smaller uh audience segments yeah that's and that's you know a trend started in cable tv but down into online is even greater yeah mason uh <coughs> a question like if this was the or it is the research paper like nobody ever or hasn't brought up driving I, I, not one time and i think that's pretty interesting because i would want to know how many people actually drive and uh, how much that affects their listening for like so be, everybody's talking about the internet going on the internet to listen to the radio so if you're driving you, you're gonna have to choose it before right so I mean you can't do that while you're driving and like for the paper that we just did it's like I drive all the time so I never use my phone I never use anything and nobody in here not once today has talked about driving so I thought that was kind of interesting for <laughs> like basic paper it. yeah so <laughs> yeah yeah there's only so much music on your phone you, you hear every day the same yeah, turn on the radio. I just do it. So, yeah, it's right. it's a great point, Mason. That that has really kept radio uh, uh, alive and central. Uh, has been you know the link up with mobile, and you know now I think with mobile phones and entertainment uh, systems in your cars, which can seamlessly link with Bluetooth to your mobile device, I think that's going to be another blow to radio probably. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know. Because it was just so easy before to you bought a car with an AM/FM radio in it, you could turn it on and 
that's it. Uh, and now if you buy a car and every single car has some kind of fancy hookup to your, to your mobile device, radio radio is probably going to get hurt again. Some of them come with satellite radio, too. So, pardon me? Some of them come with satellite radio. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and there was a huge push on to try to bring satellite radio into every car. Huge push by the satellite radio uh, uh, companies and programmers. The cars not so much interested, right? It was mostly in, in premium cars. And uh, Sirius XM were two satellite services that started up. Uh, they were <coughs> subscription services, uh, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't build enough audience, so the two of them merged until now there's basically Sirius XM is your one and only satellite system, uh, but with, you know, hundreds of channels and uh, all of them kind of targeting some very, very narrow musical tastes. John? Do um, iHeartRadio and other big, like, radio conglomerates have enough money to lobby lawmakers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. And, and uh, that's kind of speaking to what Tony was talking about, too, is, you know, iHeartRadio used to be Clear Channel. Uh, Clear Channel was, you know, the largest radio station owner in the country at one point with, like, 1,200 radio stations. Um, they went into enormous debt in order to buy all those stations. Like, they borrowed the money from the bank. And uh, they were literally having, struggling to pay their monthly mortgage payments after a while. After 2008, 2009, when the economy tanked, um, it, you know, the advertising revenue wasn't even enough to pay the mortgage for all of that, you know, huge bunch of stations. So they started selling uh, the, you know, the peripheral stations and they got rid of a good 600 stations that way. Uh, basically just selling in order to pay off the banks and stuff. And they really needed a reboot, kind of. And iHeartRadio is the way they, first they just started as a complimentary streaming, but now they're just out and out iHeartRadio channels with, uh, you know, it's another, another internet radio delivery system, basically. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's a great example of a kind of a complementary use of the internet that is, you know, as, as the whole media balance changes, you know, you are no longer Clear Channel, you're iHeartRadio in a way, and you're no longer really, you have those terrestrial stations, they're still there, but your main emphasis is as a digital, you know, station. And a lot of that has to do with Wall Street, too. You know, it's like people looking to invest are maybe not going to invest in radio. You know, radio is slowly dying. How long is it going to live? We don't really know. You, are you probably going to invest in something new, you know, streaming, streaming media? We hear about it all the time. If only we'd bought, you know, a thousand shares of Google or something, you could, you know, <laughs> if only. <laughs> Anyhow, so yeah, that, 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 that is a lot more uh, of an attractive possibility. So, so uh, I guess the point is it changes. It changes over time, you know, as, as the media balance changes. Who was thinking of saying something? Nobody? I oh yeah, John. Question about uh, back towards uh, TV taking a lot of ideas from radio when it first gets kicked off, and then radio really taking back off again in the '50s with rock and roll and all this new age music. What took TV so long to create their own dedicated music network? Wow, that's a good question. I mean, you know, the t early TV if they did a little bit of everything, right? And um, variety uh, shows and whatnot. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the wide world of sports was what they did sports. You know, you didn't have like a sports channel or something. You had Sunday sports shows and they would give way to, you know, Sunday night Disney. You know what I mean? So then you had your family show. So the limited number of channels basically turned it into like each of those niche content areas would have their little part of the schedule, you know. And uh, uh, it was what took over was... Um, the satellite distribution of programming for the cable industry. So you had, well, next week we'll talk about cable TV. It starts out just as being a way to show the same channels but with better reception. But when you finally got like global communication satellites, so you could have, you know, an MTV which would beam its programming by that satellite to Cox, Comcast, Time Warner, to all of those different cable companies so they could have a channel on each one of those services. That's when it takes off, basically. So MTV and HBO are the two big ones in the early 80s, and they both couldn't have existed without 
the satellite distribution of the channels. Yeah, it took a long time. It's true. It took a long time, but it gave radio its its niche. Which it, is, it helped it survive. Yeah. So you can go so deep on these questions as to you know as to because it's all interconnected. You know as to as to how a medium is is competing with others, but you know one thing for sure is it's. It's, all, it's a competition for audience and audience attention. You know, whether you're selling that audience to advertisers through ratings and saying, okay, I got a million people watching, or whether you're selling subscriptions you know, and you're, you're selling that way, you're, you're, you know, HBO has got to have a new Game of Thrones so that they don't lose 10% you know, of their subscribers. What's it going to be? You know, Westworld or who knows what? They're searching. You know. <laughs> and, uh, and that's constantly in order to get subscribers, you know. And Netflix has a similar sort of situation. There's no advertising on there, but they, they need a constant renewal, more people subscribing. Yeah? And there's more advertisers on even uh, basic apps like Yelp mm -hmm. or something like that. They're always trying to get more different advertisers. Oh, yeah. That, let alone anything else that is free on app. Yeah, check check out the chapter on advertising. There's scary uh, scary charts of how the advertising buy has go, all gone digital. You know, I mean, CBS, for instance, still each year the CBS old school CBS television network still makes more money in advertising every year. But as an industry, you know, uh, tons of money is going to to digital. Same thing for radio as well. You know, I don't know how podcasts can really be monetized. You know, I hear a few little sponsors messages and that's about it, you know. It's far from a big business, even compared to regular radio, which if you listen to a radio hour, there must be 15 minutes of commercials on most radio stations now, you know, terrestrial radio. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. Now, how about, um, so we did mention with the proliferation of mobile devices, you see movies and stuff like those AM radios with the little wire that would poke out and say so people at the ball game with all of those or, you know, it's like these little radios. So radio was mobile, not just in your car with the transistor, which I think was in the 1960s <laughs> that it was widely distributed and stuff. You got these little transistor radios. So radio, another thing was it was kind of like a carry it with you type of little thing, you know. And you could have it at the game or you could, if you were a kid, you didn't mind bad sound quality, you could plug in or just listen to it like that. So early mobility was important, but how about mobility nowadays with radio? Or with uh, our, our mobile phones as devices? Yeah, yeah, that's how TV become more mobile. Well, that's true, yeah. But let's save that for a TV talk. These, these are our radio, because we have a couple of topics for TV. Mason, what are you thinking? It's funny, because it's the exact same thing. It's just digital, like you keep saying. So it goes from radio frequency to a dude listening to a giant brick of a radio on his headphones. It's the same thing. It's just mm. smaller and on a screen. And your want to watch and listen outside stayed the same, right? People wanted in the 50s, couldn't have it. But once you came there, they were doing it. And now it's just digital, so you can watch it. Mm. Anyway, didn't they have that in the 70s too, kind of like almost, uh, I guess they didn't have screens, I guess, but the, the want to listen and then watch. So it's all the same, it's just digital. Clearer, like you said, better quality. And more more variety, more variety, more like niche little channels for people. Or something outside. Yeah. Dozing off or something. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan? I think the biggest difference is that everybody has one compared to back then, you know, so now the uh, idea that a radio uh, broadcast can get to your pocket somehow, so that's their job to figure out how they make that happen. So I think that's interesting that there's just a, a wider net for them to get a hold of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One thing that uh, uh, I was just seeing if anyone would bring it up, but uh, most uh, most Android smartphones, well, no, I, I exaggerate, I think. Apple phones don't have a RF, a radio receiver built into them. But uh, a lot of Android phones actually do. They're just, they don't have to turn them on, so they don't. You can download a radio app. Can you? OK. On, a, on an Apple as well? It's 199 Interesting. But then do you get terrestrial radio? Like, I think we get it. I think it's. Like, how do you access it, though? I mean, is it? Is it I haven't downloaded it. Yet. OK, <laughs> check it out. <laughs> that will probably be a, a, a later uh, type. 
Well, if you were if you were a smartphone like you know if you were Apple, <coughs> why would you not want people to be able to listen to radio on your phone? So you want somebody to buy your products, right? ITunes. Pay the one ninety nine for right. the, the streaming. Of yeah. Your Use yeah. Buy your app. Uh, stream. You know. You include this in your streaming quota or something. Right. Right, right, yeah. So, so, the, so the idea is that it would, you know, terrestrial radio, they, they don't want to basically, I mean, I read this thing a couple of days ago, I was reading an interview about this, and it was some, uh, a, uh, somebody on the digital side saying, well, if the audience really wanted it, we'd turn it on, but we won't. Uh, we, and so, but, you know, the other thing is they're not going to go out of their way to create more competition. Like, really, if you wanted to listen to the same 20 songs over and over again, popular songs, you know, terrestrial radio is not bad for that, you know. Uh, An app, apps are good for deep, big catalog, lots of variety, but if you just want, you know, like the song of the day, you can get it for free on radio. Richard? The problem up with radio is that you don't choose the content, you cannot choose the content. So you, you get whatever is on there. But with like this Spotify or Pandora, you know, you can search whatever song you want. Right. A podcast, you can search podcast. Or you set up a channel, which is sort of your preference yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like Michael was talking about time shifting as being a major, you know, component of this so that you don't have to listen to it when it goes over the air. And as you're saying as well, uh, you know, the, it's, it's control. The other thing, uh, time shifting on demand, you know, that's the other thing. You can get it when you want it and you can get it where you want it too and you know it's like oh I want that specific song you can hear that or oh I want a channel with songs like that you can get that um, when did that start I think it, I think it was Pandora wasn't it no it's like uh, Napster Napster so Napster was like the where you could download anything right right so that's that's interesting should we should we go by the official history or by the unofficial history <laughs> right so, <laughs> so, yeah, no so that's one, that's it well you know Pandora in the sense that they have to license all that music and they put an incredible amount of uh, of effort into I for a while I was geeking out about recommendation engines <laughs> okay so as we go from one topic to another, I'm sorry. I'll go back to the slides before the end of this. But recommendation engines, right? Because I got interested in this because Netflix uh, uh, created a million dollar prize for a new recommendation engine, which they never, I think, actually implemented. They gave the money out, but you know, their recommendation engine pretty much sucks now. Uh, it, it like within three, four recommendations, it's offering you, you know, like a house of cards or a Netflix original. I wonder why, because they want you to watch that. You know, that's why. If it was truly a recommendation engine, they'd be offering you, you know, something real, right? So, so there's two ways of doing recommendations, I found out, and I'll share with you now. <laughs> I promise to get back on topic, uh, which is uh, you have the Amazon approach, which is you are classified as a type of consumer and then recommendations are made on what other people like you liked. All right, so that's the Amazon approach. Um, the Pandora approach was to take the whole library of music, break it down into hundreds of categories, and then code each song like that. So that means that I would like a song with a prominent bass line. You know? So then it would recommend me other songs which somebody had tagged as having a prominent bass line. So what that requires is hiring a team of coders who will listen to all of that music and classify it and say, wow, this one has a high-pitched uh, female vocal or a raspy voice, you know, and they have to go through the entire catalog. It costs a fortune, right? So that's how Pandora did it and back in the early days. But I always thought that, I, I don't know, I've never had, who, what do you guys prefer, Spotify, <coughs> Pandora? Spotify. Spotify, man, yeah. Hey. Took over the world. They have a great recommendation yeah. system. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how it actually runs. You should find out about that. Yeah. Still so you discover a lot of Exactly. <laughs> That's the other thing I was going to bring up. <laughs> Takes over the world, but still struggling. And, you know, that's another thing. A lot of these digital businesses are less profitable than, than, than you would think about, largely through licensing fees and stuff like that. I heard a hilarious podcast about a fellow who's... Um, he produces like, like an uncanny number of songs every week, uh, puts them on Spotify, 
they, they get very few hits, but because he has literally tens of thousands of songs on Spotify, he makes a decent living, like good enough to like stay home and he just does that. And the reason is because they're all novelty songs. They're like, imagine a novelty song is like a birthday song for every name of everybody in the room and everybody who ever wow, lived, that's right? Hilarious. So he'll have all of that. But then he'll also have, to, this week I'll do puke songs. So every song has puke in the title, but it's like Jimmy puked in the toilet, Janie puked on her brother or something like that. And for each of those, he'll budget like an hour of production time. He'll write the words, he'll record the song, and he'll put it up on Spotify. The whole idea is people searching, you know, your kid's name is Jerome or something. And so you search for Jerome, Jerome's birthday song, and his might be one of the 10 that pop up or something. And he makes enough money that way, you know, versus that the artists who are there, you know, struggling to do their album. It took a year and a half. And then they complain, well, I only get 10 cents for every spin on Spotify. You know, and it's like, I'm going broke. And here's a guy who figured out the system and as weird as it is, he's, he's like, you know, it works for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like 0 0.0013 cents? It's or, really small. Yeah, it's, it's really tiny what they actually pay per stream. Yeah. So that's an issue. <coughs> well, let's, uh, let's come back comfortably to slides, I'd say. Um, satellite radio, we did talk about XM and Sirius having to combine because the business was based on subscriptions. And, uh, you know, the, they, they had to combine to stay <laughs> basically non-competitive. They had to create a monopoly in satellite radio in order for it to survive. So that's never a good sign. However, uh, that's what's going. And how many people actually listen to it? So Nobody? Oh, that's when scary. It's, when it's in a rental car. When it's in a rental car, you might. Oh, yeah. Listen to it for 10 minutes. Okay. I always like wind up, you know, with Cool Cafe or some kind of song, you know, some kind of channel like that. And it's like, oh, this is not my thing. I don't know. All right. Uh, has not led. Sorry? It was trending for a while when it first kind of. Yeah. Advertising it, I guess. Yeah, that's again what's funny about looking in the Times to see the early stories about radio. You know, it's like, like magic, a voice emerged from the ether, you know, and it's like. <laughs> Yeah, that's radio. Yeah, oh, big deal. So it's people, it's always more exciting in the beginning. It always, you know, it captures investors as well, not just, not just audiences who think about it, right? So uh, satellite radio, like your internet radio, that's another thing I wanted to ask you. You know, I was going to ask you a tricky question, like what happens to the audience? Well, I'll have to answer it, but, uh, you know, your terrestrial radio station broadcasts over a limited geographic footprint, maybe 10 miles around the transmitter, maybe 15. An AM station can go a long way, but um, <clears throat> your internet audience is global. So that's another reason, like Tony brought up, the complementarity of terrestrial radio and online radio is that, you know, you're not really cannibalizing when you create an online stream for your terrestrial radio, because you can sell advertising to the same mom and pop stores in your area, you know, your shoe stores, your mattress chains and stuff. And you can say, and this will go over the internet to who knows where, anywhere is possible, you know. And then you can also try and go uh, to different sets of advertisers who are not willing, necessarily interested in doing local advertising, but like that kind of global footprint, you know, and saying, wow, we are the most streamed station in Los Angeles, you know. Maybe, I don't know, the Olympic Committee wants to put up some ads up there in the thought that, yeah, sure, it'll be local, but it'll also be, you know, it'll help our Olympic project or whatever, you know. So, so that complementarity is, is pretty cool. But there's a downside to that, which is satellite radio cannot tailor its programming to local audiences. So a lot of radio, localism is a big deal in radio. I think we already had a question in Kahoot about that. So I repeat, uh, localism, so having a DJ talk about events that are happening in town, um, you know, playing bands from the East Bay or something like that, that's important. It's the way that the radio station stands out from most other media, you know. And um, it's, it's, it's fakeable. We'll talk about that eventually in programming. They sometimes they fake localism, but it exists. And uh, it's the same thing with cable TV. <laughs> Satellite TV can't be so local. So radio goes digital, in-band, on-channel. Uh, another digital technology that is, you know, if, if satellite is sort of struggling or not happening, 
IBOC never even began, you know. So that's the technology where you can, you can put a digital signal out on your terrestrial frequency. So if you're 88.5, you can still stay analog. Everyone can get you on their old radio. But also you can put out three channels in your digital stream that way. So it's really cool, but nobody uses it because they can't monetize it uh, adequately. No one has an IBOC receiver. Uh, it would deliver CD quality sound, so very good sound, but nobody, nobody wants it, unfortunately. So what can they tell us about internet radio that you guys don't already know? I began in the late 1990s, yeah. Licensed broadcasters supplement their over-the-air signal. Tony brought that up, that was great. How will they respond to inroads by netcasters? I've never heard that before, netcasters. Internet radio operators, maybe, or something? Um, Netcasters allow listeners to generate interest. Yeah, Pandora, Spotify. So there you go. In this book, they call them netcasters. Um, so, you know, well, that's something for your, it's a good question if you do choose that essay topic. You know, what kinds of things have you seen? Uh, I mean, uh, in my mind, what I'm seeing is, you know, there's hardly any use to be putting music on radio if you're just going to have like a auto repeat type of thing. Anyone who wants to listen to that kind of program is going to listen, they're going to stream it. You know, you've got to provide something either more local with more personality. And then we talked about certain genres which seem to be still working on radio. What's still working if, if music is not working nearly as well as it used to? Nika? Very yelly men talk shows. Very yelly men talk shows, absolutely, yes. So political talk, news talk, sports talk. NPR. NPR, that's yep. Cool. They're, like grandpa was they are whisper in. quiet. They whisper quietly. <laughs> Liberals whispering quietly, <laughs> facing off Today. against bloviators <laughs> screaming into the microphone. It's outrageous what they did. <laughs> you know, so that's... Um, yeah, yeah, we're seeing a lot of that. So you could, you could dip into that. I, I don't pretend to be at all knowledgeable about that. So if you could write about that and dig up a few names and, and think about that. But yeah, I, I don't think, I mean, you're seeing morning shows just kind of decimated, you know, big name DJs going off the air. So, so and I think it's because they don't really supply something in addition or to what the streaming services offer. Copyright issues, oh my gosh, this is another thing you might eventually look into or stuff. But like, why hasn't internet radio really taken off so much? Or why has it remained in the hands? Let's, let's put it this way. It's taken off for iHeartRadio. It hasn't taken off for you if you want to start a radio station out of your basement, um, which a lot of people might have wanted to do. And early internet looked great. Uh, it's a different copyright regime for Terrestrial radio versus digital. Terrestrial radio pays money to composers. Uh, that's what ASCAP was created to collect and still does. Didn't Remember, they don't have to pay money to performers because the whole idea was that as a performer, you get well known on the radio and you could make your money elsewhere. And if you wrote your songs, you'd make money because you were the songwriter. So when it came time for doing the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, these performers lobbied massively and said, hey, and it's time to pay us too. So as an internet streamer, you have to pay um, performance fees and author's fees. So um, that doubles the cost. And uh, a, big, a big streamer like iHeartRadio can go direct to Sony and say, okay, we're going to play all your stuff. Give us a good deal. If you're in your basement, there's no way that you can do that. So uh, iHeartRadio can get around a lot of the fees that a normal mom and pop would have to pay. Let's, uh, let's do a Kahoot to, just to round out the day. Let's head right in here. Ten questions. Are you ready? Here they come. I increased the length of time. David Sarnoff's Radio Music Box memo described a way to make money from broadcast radio. True or false? Now, I confess I opened this up, but I didn't actually show it to you and talk about it. So is it more likely that Sarnoff said you could make money by broadcasting or not? I'm going to go here myself. 14 answers. Is there a way to cut to the chase and just like... Oh, that skip button. I think we just skipped the question, right? 
gosh, you mean I can't just short circuit it? Because I, I put a minute on each one of these. What did you do? <laughs> I know. Well, the last one we were too rushed, right? It was like... Oh, yeah. So we can get it. 12 out of 3, true. Very good guess, folks. It is true. Uh, look it up if you want. Sarnoff's Music Box Memo. This is when we couldn't... They didn't even know what broadcasting was going to be. And Sarnoff, yeah, okay, big papa, you nailed it. So Sarnoff said, uh, wouldn't it be great if we had a music box in everybody's house? And that's what they started thinking about radio. So next one, radio news was controversial. The press radio war happened, which was settled by the Biltmore Agreement. <coughs> so we did talk about this. We remember the newspapers early on were worried that radio would uh, actually steal their scoops. And so... They made an agreement, so damn, it must be true. <laughs> it must be true. We got 15 answers out there. Oops. This is, oh, okay. <laughs> Some folks are doing well. I think I blasted through the answer. So that one was true. They met at the Biltmore Hotel, and they decided that radio could not do breaking news and that radio should wait until the afternoon newspaper was published before they'd run with stuff. Who invented FM radio? Sad fellow jumped to his death. Oh. <laughs> I still think it's fully dressed in evening wear. <laughs> <laughs> he had his leather gloves on. All right, we got 15 answers. Let's have a look. Oh. Yes, 15 people got the right answer. Bravo. It was Edward Howard Armstrong, the inventor of FM radio. A sad genius. And 18, who proved that electromagnetic energy traveled through the air? Was it Fessenden, the violin player? Marconi, the weird uh, Italian? <laughs> Heinrich Hertz? <laughs> or Samuel F.B. Morse? 15 answers, that means I can go. And let's see, it was Hertz, and the majority of people got that. So remember, Hertz did the demonstration of the spark gap. He creates some sparks in one place, and somewhere else there'd be a spark gap. And for that, we know, we call all audio frequencies HZ. Lee DeForest invented what? What did he invent? The F valve? The diode tube? The audion? I just wanted to like juggle <coughs> it around. So just, just answer the one that seems to say the right thing to you. What would that be? We're going right away to six people. The majority got the correct answer is the Audion. All right, the Audion. It was like a radio tube. 23, Congress has the right to regulate broadcasting because, oh, it does automatically juggle these. A, the airways belong to the people. B, American broadcasting system is a commercial enterprise. C, regularly unregulated, uh, Whatever. You can read it. <laughs> Big enough to read, right? Just. All right, I'm waiting for a 15th answer to come in. There you go. And the correct answer was the airways belong to the people. Okay, so that one bears a little explaining. Remember, the idea was that uh, it's, a, um, it's a public good, so therefore the, the government of the public should be able to regulate it. And uh, if you need to leave, go ahead and leave. Uh, but if you're staying with us for the last three questions, go for it. What we today refer to as a network was called what in the 1920? Chain broadcasting, spoke broadcasting, shuttle broadcasting. All right, I see answers pouring in. It's kind of fun to watch the answers come up. And we're going to go ahead with just 12. And chain broadcasting, seven. So the majority got the correct answer. It was called chain. Remember, you could chain together stations. Oh, prior to the Radio Act of 1927, stations were encouraged to take, ah, I didn't even tell you enough about that. So these are all true, all of the above. <laughs> Yay. Yay, everyone's boosting their scores. <laughs> we do like to get the answer right, don't we? And 31, Westinghouse was interested in broadcasting because it would do what? Make more revenue from advertising. Was Westinghouse a broadcaster or what did they actually make? Bread. 
Fred. <laughs> they made things like light bulbs and oh. radio receivers, right? It said wholesome entertainment. That's why I said Brett. Oh, I see. <laughs> and, you know, B, allow them to sell more radio receivers. That is correct. All right, Westinghouse and RCA built the radio receivers. <coughs> And the networks made the content. And AT&T linked all the stations with long distance wires. And I believe that's it. Oh my God, more. 10, one more. Radio stations profited during World War II because advertisers bought radio ads instead of print. Is that true or false? I said it, I said it. I made a big deal out of it. Oh, come on guys. They switched the truth. Up we go, up we go, up we go. Yeah, I flipped the true and false. I gotta turn that off. Skip. True is the correct answer. Remember, there was rationing of stuff for the Second World War, including newsprint. So radio was able to take over because airwaves didn't consume anything. All right, have a great weekend. I'll start reading your uh, assignments, and uh, we'll see you next week for TV history.